Now, 2020 has been the most unusual school year in living memory for most of us, as the coronavirus pandemic prompted the closure of classrooms around the world. According to the UN, up to 1.5 billion children across 100 countries have been affected by school closures, and many have been forced to take lessons remotely. Now, education authorities all around the world and schools, they've been rushing to take classrooms online. And in many cases, there have been great challenges in preserving the quality of classes, keeping students engaged and focused, and also maintaining a good connection as Wi-Fi can sometimes fail us. But some observers believe this crisis could be turned into an opportunity to improve and widen access to quality education. So is online learning the future? To address this issue today, we're joined by Michael Barber, Associate Professor of Instructional Design at Turo University, California. Hello, Michael. It's lovely to have you with us. Thank you for having me. We all, we're also joined by Mary Jo Madder, Program Manager for Diversity and Education at Google. It's great to see you today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, why don't we start with you, Michael? So right now, all over the world, online learning is something that schools are making do with. But some say that in the long run, it's going to be the future of schooling. So would you agree with that? Do you think it should become permanent or remain a permanent option at least? Um, remaining a permanent option, I think, is, is a good start for this. Uh, one of the things I think we have to remember when we look at the current situation is that teachers and students were just thrown into this kind of environment. And teachers, when they're trained to come into the classroom, are trained to come into a face-to-face -face classroom. The students that we have, unless they're year one or kindergarten students, they have experience and they have a sense of this is how to be successful in a face-to-face -face environment. And then all of a sudden, mid-year in some cases, we've just decided that, okay, we've got to make this, this big switch. And no one was really ready for it. So I think if you have a system where you have folks that have been trained to teach in this kind of environment and students have the opportunity to have experience with and get accustomed to learning in this environment, I think it can be a viable option for a lot of students out there. Mary Jo, would you agree with that? Do you think online learning really is the future for school children? Uh, I do and I don't. I do think that there are certain elements of online learning that are incredible. Uh, they really have offered us the only option, given what the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us into. At the same time, uh, if somebody asks me, do I think online learning is going to replace live learning as we know it, I would say no. I think that I sense more of a future for the hybrid model, where there's elements of the online learning space and the live learning space brought together once COVID-19 is dealt with from a public health perspective. Well, Michael, as you briefly mentioned, schools have been rushing into this and teachers have been largely unprepared um, taking their classrooms, their teaching material all online all of a sudden. So really, how can they then keep their pupils engaged in an online format? Well, I think it depends upon when you're talking about exactly. So when all of this first happened in March, in all honesty, anything that a teacher could do to maintain some sort of continuity of learning, uh, my hat's off to them because it was an emergency situation. They were triaging that situation as best they could. And again, hats off to them. I think they did wonderful jobs. As we've started to move forward into this process now, depending upon the type of school system you have, if it's a year-round system that runs from January to December, or more of a North American model that falls from Labor Day to sometime in June, we've had a chance now to sit back and, and see you know, things that haven't worked, um, things that we need to provide training for, for teachers, ways in which we can better use the tools that are available to us. In some cases, just how to get those tools into the hands of students. And if we can't get those tools into the hands of students, what other alternatives do we have to provide them with a, a quality education? And these are some of the things that I think with time we'll figure out um, the school systems that here in North America that are starting up right about now, in all honesty, they should have done a better job over the summer preparing for what I think was an eventuality here now. Uh, many of them are scrambling now as much as they were in March, even though we've had you know six months to think about how to do this well. 
Um, and to me, that just doesn't do justice for the students. Mm -hmm. And well, Mary Jo, when there are so many distractions on the internet and on digital devices as well, how should teachers try as they might engage students online and make sure that they're making progress? That's a really valid question. I myself struggle to stay fully engaged throughout eight hours on a laptop. I'm sure a lot of us do. And I think one of the tactics that I've seen that's been pretty successful is this idea of bal balancing asynchronous learning with synchronous learning. Synchronous learning essentially describes when everybody is on a video call all at the same time receiving instruction. But asynchronous can be taken offline or done on the student's own time. They can choose when, how they do it. And in my opinion, if you wanna keep students engaged more in a synchronous environment, you need to give them more opportunities to be out of a chat, out of a video call, doing independent projects, independent assignments, independent work. It just frees up their mind to be more focused on their individual learning. And then when you come back into a synchronous space, you aren't so over inundated with the constant, you know, staring at the screen, listening to everyone else. So it gives them a little bit of a break. So my recommendation is if you want to have more engagement in those synchronous moments, give students more of an opportunity for the independent learning at the same time. Well, if more remote learning is used in the future, then obviously students are going to spend more time alone at home. And well, Michael, there are concerns that children may really lose out on the social interactions um, in schooling, which are deemed one of the crucial aspects of traditional schools. Would you agree with that? It's a valid concern, but I think one of the things we often forget is that while schooling is a valuable and useful way for socializing kids, it's not the only way. Um, you know, children are involved in youth sports, various, you know, youth service groups. Um, many of them are involved in, you know, church groups or other community-based activities. And sure, while we've been in this pandemic and we've had these stay-at-home orders, um, throughout really the globe that has taken its toll. If you think about the use of online or remote learning post pandemic, um, the socialization aspect to me is, is one that becomes less important. Um, right now, I think, you know, the social emotional learning that our students are, are experiencing becomes of utmost importance because in so many cases they're in situations where they aren't able to you know go out to the local playground or to you know go to their little league or I'm originally Canadian so I always think of minor hockey as, as my outlet um, and uh, you know so I think now it's really incumbent upon particularly educators because it's one of the few times where we actually get them all in one place um, in that synchronous session, as Mary Jo mentioned, that we can, you know, engage them and so and, and have them socialize with each other. I mean, of course, some may be involved in church groups or sports or any other activities, but you can't deny that school is, you know, an everyday way that children can really form relationships, get along with their peers and, you know, learn how to handle hum um, interactions. I mean, Mary Jo, don't you think that they would be losing out on the social aspect here if, you know, we all um, just go online learning just in the future, just mainly online learning, I mean? There's certainly, that's something that you can't deny. At the same time, I think we do our students a disservice when we ignore the fact that for many of them, socialization on the internet is something that they are doing whether COVID's happening or not. I mean, the number of my students who constantly remind me how much they love TikTok is a reality. And to what Dr. Barber said, there are other opportunities like esports that students are using for socialization. Now, I'm a huge proponent of the importance of having live in-person interactions, particularly between teachers and students because that bond that you form with adults can in many ways become mentorships that last with you for the rest of your life. And those have become somewhat different in an online context. Um, however, they are still forming and there are some responses to the realities of the harder socialization practices. Uh, one thing we've been hearing a lot about is this concept of learning pods where essentially 
very small groups of parents and students or organizing with an instructor, you know, maybe three to four students, they've gotten tested for COVID and they've elected to essentially form almost like a mini pod. And that's one potential answer to this question of, you know, how we give kids the opportunity to be with one another. Um, do I think that's the solution? I think it's a solution, but that's not necessarily an option that's accessible to everybody. And getting creative with the hybrid, maybe some offline and some online may be the solution path forward, at least as long as we are relegated to learning from home. Well, many say that even before COVID-19, we were switching to digital more and more so. And well, Mary Jo, do you think Generation Z in particular, they require a different form of education to one that we're very familiar with? I mean, especially with the sort of social and technological transformations that we're experiencing with the fourth industrial revolution. There is an argument to be made about the reality that students are coming into our classrooms each and every day with a greater command of the online world than my generation and generations before us had. They were born into a space where the internet existed. They don't know a world in which the internet was not there. So no matter who you are as a child, you have social settings online that you are a part of, whether it's through social media or online gaming platforms or through even just texting your friends. Uh, technology is an integral part of these communities that these students are a part of. My bigger concern, however, comes with the way that we are assessing students. And I think that the way that we are assessing doesn't necessarily speak to the command of these digital technologies that students have. I think we're still treating a lot of our communities of students like we're living in the 1950s, that everybody sort of learns in the same style, has the same kind of baseline of understanding when they come to the classroom. And that's just not the reality in which we live. And so my bigger concern is, is COVID-19 going to push us to rethink what high stakes standardized assessment looks like? Because I think it's time. Do you agree with that, Michael? Do you think there should be a fundamental change in the way we teach children? I mean, and uh, you know, accommodating to their individual needs and different levels of progress as well. Well, one of the takeaways I, I would get from what Mary Jo just said was the fact that when you look at the research into generational differences, one of the things that we know is that the pervasive nature of technology hasn't impacted the way that people learn and the way that people's brains are wired and those types of things. Having said that, and this is I think the, 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 the takeaway from it, is that they, as Mary Jo pointed out quite correctly, they come to us with this innate ability with all of these tools. And a good teacher tries to leverage the things that students know how to use and know how to do and things that they're interested in and passionate about and tries to incorporate that both into the content that they teach, but also the manner in which they teach. Um, on the assessment side, I, I think Mary Jo is, is exactly correct. Uh, we, for so long, particularly here in North America, have been pushing more and more and more to more standardized models of assessment, these multiple choice bubble style quizzes that we, we give students. And probably the biggest difference in this generation, because the tools are so pervasive and so available, is they really have become creators, much more so than any previous generation. I mean, for me, when I was a kid, if I wanted to build something, it had to be something physical. I mean, the technology didn't exist for me to go creating these wonderful things online or, you know, even just on my local computer. Whereas now, students have this ability, and most of them come to us already doing this. And then when we ask them to show that they've learned something, we want them to fill in these little bubbles on a Scantron sheet so that you know we can run it through this computer and figure out what percentage of them have mastered something. And, and that's really a disconnect uh, that's happening on the assessment front. Well, hopefully in the new normal, we will break away from this standardized model of testing. But right now, what, uh, Michael, what students are facing, especially those who are looking to go to college, is that they're not getting the sufficient uh, schooling that they need in order to take these uh, nationally standardized tests and also pass on to um, the next year or whatever they, they need to do to progress to higher education. So 
How do you think national authorities should really deal with this problem? Do you think students should be held a year back? What do you think should be the solution? Um, in all honesty, I don't think there's a, a good solution or a good answer to that question. Um, one of the things that the current situation has really forced upon us is we really have a, a learning gap and unfortunately it's, it's often happened around socioeconomic status. You know, those that have economic means, they're the folks that have parents that are more engaged. They're the ones that are able to go and supplement things beyond the curriculum. Oftentimes they're able to pay for uh, individual tutoring or other services that they can get. They're the ones that have reliable internet and the devices that they need in order to be able to access the curriculum on a regular and consistent basis. Um, whereas you've got these other students that really don't have those things. And, um, you know, so some of the students, in all honesty, will sit for their exams and they'll be at roughly the same place they would have been had we not had a pandemic. Um, I think what the pandemic has really exposed is the fact that there is a definite educational opportunity gap that falls around socioeconomic status. And really, I think it's been exacerbated in recent years. And we've just now seen a great example of it with, you know, who can have access to learning. Well, hopefully this crisis can be turned into an equalisation opportunity, but I'm afraid we're out of time today and this is where we'll have to wrap up the discussion. That was Michael Barber, Associate Professor of Instructional Design at Turo University, California, and Mary Jo Mazza, Programme Manager for Diversity and Education at Google. Thank you both so much for your insights. Thank, thank you, you for having us. And to our viewers, as always, thank you for watching. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time in Korea. Have a lovely day or evening, wherever you are. Goodbye.